Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions, and my first question this week comes to me from Sailing Senor, who says, Hey Steve, I love your videos. I was interested in getting your opinion on abortion and contraception. With all the new legislation regarding the procedure in Texas and North Carolina, the pro-life position has been on my mind lately. I've never been able to understand the Catholic approach, anti-abortion, anti-contraception. How could one both oppose abortion and methods used to prevent unplanned pregnancies, thus abortions? To me, that's like opposing drowning and swim lessons. Your thoughts. And I also want to mention that Clay Doe 34 uh, also asked a question about my, asked for my opinion on abortion. Yeah, uh, I agree with you about the Catholic position there, Sailing Senor. Um, dr opposing drowning and swimming lessons is a good way of, of describing it. Uh, I don't, I don't consider that a logical position. I don't see how that's a coherent position, but uh, I understand their justification for it. Uh, I think the, the overarching sort of traditional justification for the opposition to contraception and the opposition to abortion is the idea that it's all incumbent upon us to bring as many potential people into the world as we possibly can. Uh, now, I think that's a very silly idea. I think it's a, a, a religious, superstitious idea, not a scientific idea. This notion of, of uh, potential people, you might also call them hypothetical people because they don't really exist. A potential person is just an abstract concept. It's a might be. Uh, there, there's this idea, I think, in some the minds of some religious folks that that there are these disembodied, unborn souls just kind of floating around, waiting to be born into bodies uh, when children are conceived, and as if they're real somehow, like they're real and they're somewhere right now waiting, and that's just not the case. There, a potential person is not a person. A potential person is just an abstract concept. Uh, if you haven't been born yet, if you haven't been conceived yet, then you do not exist <laughs> in any actual sense of the word. You're just not here. Um, and in addition to that, it's just a really irresponsible idea that, that it, we should be having as many children as possible. Given the economic and environmental realities of most of the civilized world, that is a shockingly irresponsible attitude to have. I mean, I don't think we as a society should be celebrating when people are having six, seven, eight, nine, ten children. I mean, I, I just don't think that's good for, for all of us, for us as a, as a community. I, don't, I, I think we should be discouraging that type of behavior. Um, I think that we, that the governments of the civilized world should be working in the opposite direction. We should be trying to come up with, with responsible, long-term, voluntary strategies for gradually reducing the population rather than continuing to pump as many new people into the world as we possibly can. Uh, that's why it only makes sense to not only support the availability of contraception, but to fucking encourage people to use it. <laughs> to say, hey, unless you're absolutely sure that you want to have a child and you're able to care for that child, please don't have children. Exercise control over your reproduction. Use a condom. Use a birth control pill. Do something. Stop having kids that, that you're not absolutely sure that you want and that you can take care of. Um, that is a big, a big deal for me. As for abortion, the way I look at it is I feel like it should be, it should remain a legal option for women who need it and want it. Uh, it should be more easily available in the United States than it is. Uh, it's, and all over the world as well. There are places that are even more difficult to get an abortion than here, certainly. Uh, but it should remain a, an option uh, for people who need it. And I feel like as a man and as someone who will never be pregnant and will never have a need for that procedure, it's really outside of my jurisdiction. I get uncomfortable when male politicians uh, decree that, that a woman's right to an abortion should be revoked, that, uh, that women should not have the right to that procedure, because uh, that's one of those situations in life that I will just never be in. And I feel like my ability to not only, how, not only hold an opinion of it, but then to expect my opinion to be imposed on others through law, uh, I just don't think that's fair. I don't think I should have that right. Uh, so my, my position on abortion is keep it legal, keep it safe, keep it available. Next up from Test Meat Doll Steak, Mr. Shives. 
What are your thoughts on the atheist monument that was recently installed in Florida? Is it more of a secular statement about separation of church and state, or perhaps an attack on Christianity than it is a monument to atheism? Would the money spent on establishing these monuments, more a plan for the future, perhaps be better spent in other ways, funding education, donating to charities, etc.? Also, is it just me, or is David Silverman a terrible rep for atheism? Well, that atheist monument is only necessary because there are religious monuments of the same type on public property. Don't forget that atheist monument that was just unveiled uh, in Florida is right next to a Ten Commandments monument. So that's why it's there. It's for purposes of equal time. Uh, I guess the, 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 this, the compromise we've reached as far as separation of church and state and displays on public property is that will allow... Uh, religious displays on public property as long as we open it up to all religions and also groups that profess no religion and we'll, we'll consider that kosher uh, to coin a phrase. Um, I would prefer <laughs> if there just weren't any religious displays uh, of any kind allowed on public property at all if we just said you know what we're just not going to have any. Uh, if there weren't any Christian displays on public property or, or religious displays of any kind then there would be no need for an atheist display on public property to uh, establish uh, equal time. And I'd be fine with that. I mean, in a sense, I, I see how it's, it's a good thing. Maybe you can see it as uh, we have public displays of different religions, and it's, it's like a celebration of, of our pluralistic culture. And we, we, know we all live under, under one secular government, but we, we believe in different gods, or some of us believe in no gods, and we honor different traditions. But we're able to come together and live together and cooperate. And that's a nice idea. Unfortunately, I fear that uh, most of the Christians who erect monuments like that on public property aren't interested in celebrating our pluralistic culture. They're more interested in marking their territory. Um, as for David Silverman, I, I, I wouldn't say he's a terrible rep for atheism. I do think he's a little bit too much of an attack dog. Um, I, I think he's not quite eloquent and charming enough to pull off that a very aggressive mode that he usually has. Uh, Hitchens could get away with it because Hitchens was Hitchens. He was just incredibly charming and intelligent and, and he could rip someone a new asshole but still come off as, 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 as likable. Um, and Silverman doesn't really have that ability. I, he was the only speaker that I saw at the, at the Reason Rally. And he was featured very prominently because he was one of the organizers uh, who didn't really connect with me. And it was because he had such an aggressive tone. Uh, and I just, I just didn't dig that, you know. Um, I don't think, I mean, I've seen him in debates. I think he usually does a good job. Again, he's not Hitchens, he's not Dawkins, uh, he's not Dennett, he's not Sam Harris. But, you know, I mean, really, who is? There's not, there's not very many other people that are at that level of intellect and charm and, and likability and, and, and have the ability to engage with the arguments of the religious. Um, I mean, I don't have a huge problem with Silverman. I do have problems with his tone, but I would, he's not the best rep for atheism, but I certainly wouldn't say he's a terrible one. Brian Justice, I have a question since you said in one of your You Had to Ask segments that you wrote a Batman story. Have you ever written a Superman story? Would you want to do a story putting Superman and Batman together like they've done in past and present issues of Superman Batman comics? You know what, Brian? Writing a Superman Batman team up book would probably be my dream job as, as a comic book writer. If I could magically bestow upon myself a career as a comic book writer and I could pick any project to do, I would love to do a Superman Batman team up book. Uh, I, would, I would want it to be something like, kind of like Legends of the Dark Knight was. Uh, where the stories aren't connected to the current continuity, so I don't have to worry about what every other writer is doing. I can just tell Superman, Batman stories that I think are good, that I think are interesting and fun, and not have to worry about making sure it all hooks up to what everything else uh, is, is doing. I think that's just absolute creative death. I wish comics would get away from that in general. Um, so yeah, that would be my dream job. I've written, I've, I don't think I've ever written a, a solo Superman fanfic uh, but I have written some Batman, Superman, I've written some Batman stories where Superman shows up. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would, yeah, of course, as, as a fan of Batman, as a fan of Superman, as a fan of comic books, uh, if I, <laughs> that would be my dream gig, writing Superman and Batman in a team-up book. That would be, it wouldn't get any better than that. Captain Fantastardo, okay, I've recently subscribed, and on the off chance you've not already answered, and at the risk of being laughed at, I have to ask, 9-11, you consider the theory of it being an orchestrated false flag operation to be crap? I ask because there appears to be a certain amount of evidence pointing at something being amiss. 
I spent some time being a conspiracy theorist until I saw the light, but some of the 9-11 seems fishy to me. Yes, I consider the notion of 9-11 being an inside job to be crap, uh, to say the least. That's putting it gently. And I, I say notion because it's, I don't think it's proper to call it a theory. Uh, a theory is a comprehensive explanation of something, and conspiracy theories are not that. Conspiracy theories are paranoid, delusional uh, assumptions that alternative explanations exist. Uh, but they're not theories themselves. They're not explanations. It's a bit of a misnomer. Um, yeah, I, I, the 9-11 truth movement to me is intellectually and in terms of its character just utterly beneath contempt. I have such feelings of, of just resentment and animosity and disgust about the, the, the whole 9-11 truth movement is just... Uh, shit on my shoes as far as I'm concerned. I've made actually several videos about it um, on, on my channel. If you're a new subscriber, you might not have seen them. Um, I did two Five Stupid Things About 9-11 Truth. I did a video called uh, Seriously the Hell with the 9-11 Truth Movement. And then I did a video called Stephen Stuffy and the 9-11 Truth uh, that actually of all of them is probably the best one in summing up my feelings about the 9-11 Truth Movement and my, and my thoughts about their claims, etc. Uh, and the, uh, the, the words that I place in Stuffy's mouth in that video, uh, especially his, his final rant against the, the truth movement, is pretty much my exact thoughts on the 9-11 truth movement. So you might want to look those videos up elsewhere on my channel if you're, if you're interested in hearing me talk about the 9-11 truth movement in, in greater detail at greater length. But uh, suffice it to say... The short version is, yes, I think that their claims are crap. I think it's garbage. I don't think there's anything to it. Uh, the, the, the evidence that something was amiss to me is all either uh, misinterpretation or uh, just outright fabrication, lies on the part of truthers, or ignorance, just not knowing what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, and, and whatever remains can be chalked up to legitimate failures on the part of the government or the intelligence or the response uh, leading up to 9-11 or in the confusing, you know, immediate chaotic aftermath of 9-11. In other words, stuff that is better explained without the assumption that it was an inside job. Uh, yeah, the 9-11 truth movement is crap. And if you were a conspiracy theorist but you've now stepped into the light but you still think there might kind of be something to it, my suggestion to you would be to take a few more steps toward the light. Cyborg Atheist, assuming you had had full creative control over Star Trek Voyager, what would you change to improve it? Generally speaking, I would pretty much do everything I could to distance it creatively and in terms of its tone and in terms of its feel from the previous Star Trek series. Uh, which is sort of kind of what Deep Space Nine did, in a way. I mean, the Deep Space Nine setting was much closer uh, in terms of its location to the other Star Trek show, to Next Generation, and you saw a lot of the same aliens and a lot of the same uh, characters and a lot of the same plot lines were sort of referenced. Uh, but Deep Space Nine itself tried to be a different type of show. It was more stationary. They didn't have, they weren't traveling out into the universe. They were on a, a, a space station orbiting a planet uh, or, or orbiting a wormhole. Um, but with Voyager, it felt too familiar. It felt too much like Next Generation. And they took all of the possibilities that they had uh, to make it different, and they just kind of threw those out the window with the pilot. I mean, what I would have done is kept the Maquis crew and the Federation crew separate. I would have kept that Maquis ship around as long as I possibly could have. I would have emphasized the division and the tension between the two crews. I would have made that a major part of the show. I would have made their dwindling resources a major source of drama and tension in the show. I would have had no holodeck episodes. I would have made a really big deal about having to find food and resources. Uh, I would have had no familiar aliens, no Klingons, no Romulans, no, nothing like that at all. It would have, they would have been lost. The ships would have been lost. And it would have, I would have tried my best to make it as, as different of a Star Trek show as it possibly could be, instead of just a Next Generation retread, which unfortunately is what it turned out to be. No Borg, no Q, no nothing. I'm serious, okay? Nothing. All new stuff. You have a Federation ship, you have people in Federation uniforms. Other than that, completely different show. Maybe we could even lose the uniforms. Rai Morgi, hey Steve, pretend your national anthem had a reference to God in it, like, God keep our land glorious and free. 
Would that make you cringe a little like I do when you sing along, or do you feel it's just a song, no big deal? Being an atheist, I find it a little uncomfortable to go along with the God part. Generally speaking, that sort of thing doesn't bother me. I just uh, assume that that's just the song, and if I'm singing along with a song, I don't, like, not say God or feel weird about it. And actually, in the American National Anthem of the Star Spangled Banner, there is a reference to God in one of the later verses that we usually don't sing. Uh, the first verse, which is the verse that is almost always just sung as the national anthem, there are no God references in that, but there, there is a God reference in one of the, I think the third or the fourth verse of, uh, of the Star Spangled Banner. So it's there, we just never sing it. And actually, when I did um, uh, my most recent video with uh, the Stuffed Animals, the most recent Steve and Stuffy video, where we all sing My Country Tis of Thee, uh, there are verses in that song that reference God, and I left those out. The good thing about that song is that it's been written and added to and rewritten so many times over the years, there are so many verses to choose from. And when I was choosing verses for each of us to sing, I just was able actually to pick verses that left out the references to God. So I did have that luxury. Uh, I had that option and I exercised it. But uh, but usually it, it's not a big deal for me. I mean, there are, I've, there are songs that I really love other than patriotic anthems, you know, that make reference to religious things or to God, and I don't have a problem with it. Uh, I just figure it's just a song. Cyborg Collective. I am attempting to write some short stories. However, I am finding the writing process somewhat difficult. I have lots of ideas, but find it's hard to flesh them out. Any tips on story writing? Yes, write. The best advice anybody can give anyone who wants to be a writer or wants to improve as a writer is to write. Just write, write, write. Sit down, and even if it doesn't seem to be flowing from you naturally, force yourself to write. Get it down on paper, and then recognize that a lot of writing is rewriting. Don't expect to be able to just sit down in front of your computer and vomit out a perfect story in a first draft. Get it out. Put it down. Write it. Get it on the screen. Get it on paper, and then go back and fix it and improve it. Uh, that's the best advice I can give you. Writing is rewriting. That's an old cliche. But it's true. The best thing to do is to just start with your first draft and just go straight through to the end. Right from beginning to end, the first draft. Don't worry about going back and fixing things as you go. Uh, you'll get stuck. You'll, you'll be working on the same page for six months. Just, just write, 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 write. And then when you're finished with a draft, go back and start making changes. And rewrite as often as possible until you feel like it's as good as it can be. Um, it can be tedious. But your your to me your number one loyalty as a writer is to your story, and your your job is to make your story as good as it can be and to tell your story as well as you can tell it, and that will usually require lots and lots of rewriting. Uh, that's the best that's the best advice I can give you. Just do it. Just sit down and write. Oh boy, yeah, and, and uh, four apparently agrees <laughs> because it is now time for. The Lightning Round. Rapid Fire Questions. Glib and Adequate Answers. Smith Brass, as a Star Trek fan, did you see the series Enterprise with Scott Bakula, and what was your take on it? I thought it was a waste of Scott Bakula. <laughs> Major missed opportunity there. They, they, they pretended that they wanted to do something bold and different and fresh, and then they just went ahead and made another Star Trek show. Radical Bacon, so what is the best character evolution of all time? in the context of a TV show. I would say Andy Sipowitz on NYPD Blue. He goes from being a racist asshole from the first episode all the way through to the end of the last season where I would argue that he is actually a good person um, at the end of the show. And it's a wonderful thing to watch if you watch the show all the way through. Uh, what three is for life? Since you are an English major, do you know any possible long-term careers that someone with this major can pursue? It seems difficult, being an English major myself, to figure out exactly what you can do with this major. You can't do anything with it, you're fucked. Uh, enjoy being a substitute teacher. Or, you know, start a YouTube channel. <laughs> the and I. My son wants to know if the emblem on your hat is your emblem for Black Ops 2. He saw it in one of his battles tonight. No, it's the Hagerstown Suns logo, uh, my, my local minor league baseball team, and I don't play Black Ops 2, so that was not me that your son saw in the game. I don't, I don't, I don't play video games. I don't play that. We got important shit to do, like make YouTube videos. I can't fuck around playing video games. Uh, Zombie Waru, what's wrong with Bill Paxton? Uh, he's a fucking terrible actor. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Failure to communica. What is your favorite Dark Matter 2525 video? Probably if I had to think of just one, and the one that I usually think of off the top of my head when I think of Dark Matter's videos is one that he did about maybe a year ago, maybe a little bit more, called If God Were a Firefighter. I just love that one. It's, it's, it's the perfect Dark Matter video because uh, it's really funny, but yet it also has this really clear, lucid, very biting takedown of, of a, a very important uh, Christian tenet. Uh, and I just think it's wonderful. Um, if God were a firefighter, absolutely, definitely. My favorite Dark Matter 2525 video. That's it for the questions. The lightning round is over. But before I leave you this week, I want to do a shout out, as always. And the shout out this week goes to Julia Galiff, and her YouTube channel is uh, Measure of Doubt. That's her YouTube handle. And uh, Julia Galiff is uh, a, a, a relatively well known figure in the skeptical community. She's the co host of the Rationally Speaking podcast, she's a blogger at Rationally Speaking. Um, and for some reason, her YouTube channel only has like 1,500 subscribers, and that is a travesty because there are some really good videos up there that she's made, some really interesting stuff. Uh, recently, she made a video, I guess about a month ago, I think it's her most recent video, about uh, Bayes' theorem and, and how uh, judging things by probability can help us determine what our beliefs are and, and what the most reasonable assumptions are for us to think about things. And uh, it's just a really interesting video and a, a really good uh, summary and statement of, of just rational thinking and of how we make decisions and of how we decide what we believe and what assumptions we act on and how we make choices in everyday life. Just really interesting stuff and she's a really good speaker, really sharp, and she deserves way more subs than 1500 subs. I mean, I know she's not maybe primarily a YouTuber, but come on, you know? She's, she's, she needs more subs, so uh, check out her channel. If it's to your liking, uh, subscribe, check out her stuff. Very well worth your time, I think. So that is it for this week. I will be back to do this again next week. Please leave a comment on this video and ask me your question for next time because, of course, for me to do this again next week, you have to ask. Leave a comment asking me a question about anything you want to hear me flap my stupid gums about. Uh, I will shoot my mouth off about literally any subject you can ask about if I have anything interesting to say about it, that is. So please leave a comment. Ask me your question for next time. No subject is off limits. Nothing is too goofy and inconsequential. Nothing is too somber and sober and, and way too heavy and inappropriate for a forum such as this. Please ask a question about anything you want to hear me talk about, and I will answer as many of them as I can next week. Until then, have a good one.